Scott, will you tell us um, where you are physically located in the world right now? Sure, yeah. I uh, currently live in Arizona in the United States, up in uh, northern Arizona. So if you hear the word Arizona and you're thinking saguaro cactuses in Phoenix, we're, um, we're at 7,000 feet here. So we're over a mile higher in elevation than Phoenix is. So it's a, it's a very different climate. I just had, we just dug out last week from a, a snowstorm. We got 30 inches in one day. Wow. <laughs> so, so 30 inches is, um, what's that? That's uh, two and a half feet of snow. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of and is that normal for that um that part of the world no that was a bit of a record breaker i think the um the the, the it's a little variable because we're right next to a mountain but um i think the the actual record in town was 41 inches so a little over a meter right uh, which was i think uh was the it broke a record from 1915 or something like that so it was it was remarkable okay um well i'm in um, brisbane uh, southeast queensland which has been extremely dry and no no snow here to report. <laughs> in fact, no precipitation really whatsoever, apart from a little tiny bit this morning. But um, um, so tell me, um, your, uh, we're going to talk about climate change. So tell me your credentials and how, how you fit into the world of climate change. And also tell me how you came to get interested in climate change and what, what that process was. Oh, sure. So I, um, in university, I studied uh, geology and uh, we had an environmental studies program. And I kind of directed myself into looking at, at groundwater, which is what I studied in graduate school, because um, I was very interested in that sort of physical world, um, ecological interaction with, with groundwater and the surface water systems and stuff like that. But uh, I've always been interested in, in climate change as a sort of pressing issue that we have stupid debates about. And so it makes you want to learn something. Uh, and when I got out of graduate school, I began working as a science journalist. So I've been writing for uh, the science section of Ars Technica for, I guess, seven or eight years now. Um, and I primarily cover climate change, but also other geoscience stuff. Um, and so and I've been teaching throughout this time as well, teaching at community colleges and um, introductory courses kind of things. And then more recently, in the last few years, I've also been involved with climatefeedback.org, which is a, a fact-checking website. Uh, I'm the editor there, and so when we have a, a news article that's kind of going viral, we send it out to scientists. So we don't do the, it's not that I do the fact-checking, it's that I send it out to scientists and then edit together all their responses. So we try to make everything focused on sort of letting the scientists uh, speak to it directly. Okay, so yeah. That's, that's, and that's a, that's a really in interesting um, point. Um, in my reading of climate change, there is, there is lots of different, there's lots of information out there and actually trying to get to the truth is something, it's actually quite, can be quite difficult. And so on one hand, when the climate scientists actually report in their science papers, those science papers are very obviously close as you get to the scientific truth really, you know, the peer reviewed ones, but they're so siloed and specialist that it's very difficult to get a broad scale understanding. And then when you get something like the IPCC um, with all of its political biases and it's, um, uh, you know, it's, it's doesn't like to overstate things. So it, it tends to err on the side of non caution. Um, and then of course you get all of the, the people on the internet um, of which who are very, very, there are a lot of very outspoken people who aren't necessarily very grounded in the science and tend towards hyperbole. And so there's this whole spectrum of information out there. And sometimes it's very difficult to actually know, what the hell is actually going on? <laughs> and so, yeah, and I, I think it's been useful for journalists too. Even you know, apart from if we have some ridiculous article written by a, you know a denialist blogger or something, uh, they love to knock that pinata around. But sort of, in a, I think in, a, in an even more useful way, stories at the New York Times, at the Washington Post, at things that are generally reliable, when they get that feedback from the scientists and they say. That, well, you know, you didn't quite explain this right, or this is not actually what the most recent research shows. I think that's been useful for them, and they've appreciated it. And you think, and do you think that the, because I've done plenty of work with the media, and, and what I've tended to find with journalists is that they, um, they, they, tend, they tend not to have, obviously they're not specialists in a field. So if you go and do a story about climate change, you can't expect them to be able to spot any errors for a start, because that's not their discipline or training. But in my experience, they tend not to actually do a lot of background research. And so they tend, what, and what I've found dealing with journalists is the only way to get a, them to accurately portray a story 
is to be very, very disciplined in the information you write in the mm. press release um, and do your very best to have them actually recite what's in the press release because otherwise they just throw in all of this stuff which actually doesn't make a lot of sense. And then you as the person that's putting the information out looks like a bit of a ninny because here's these people reporting incorrectly on the things that you've actually said. Um, so as a journalist yourself, I mean, how, how have you found the way that journalists approach climate change? It, it absolutely depends on the, to, to an extent, the outlet. And I think more importantly, the, the person, are they a specialist, like you're saying? Because there are many places where people are forced to be generalists. They're forced to, you know, write three different stories a day on wildly different topics and uh, be learning quickly about some, science, some climate change study when it's not normally what they do. And it's, a, it's very difficult for them. And I think those stories usually don't turn out as well as when you have people who are sort of dedicated to that beat, um, which you can have at the larger newspapers, uh, particularly, or the focused outlets. So, I mean, like I've been able to do that uh, in sort of a, a little niche that we have. And there are places like Carbon Brief uh, and other websites like that that can, can narrow in on it. And they do a much better job of providing the correct context to understand things because they know what it is. They don't have to get it from a quote in order to be able to put it in the story. Yeah, no, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, uh, yeah, now the other thing as well is that there, there's, there's sort of a spectrum of views on climate change. In fact, I came across your work um, through a, um, a critique you wrote on some of the science that underpins the narrative around uh, near-term human extinction. Um, in fact, I mean, going back in my sort of history, I've been involved in climate change since about 2002 when I worked, started working and auditing uh, businesses for carbon. So I started as a carbon auditor. So that was, um, so I've been involved in this space um, for about 16 years. And for most of that time, really until about 2013, my readings or understanding of climate change came through uh, the IPCC and through the Australian uh, Commonwealth Governments. Mm -hmm. um, work which is based on the IPCC and and what sort of shifted my thinking or, or sort of really got me sort of um, you know I'd always been led to believe that climate change was this slow moving beast but it was in 2013 when I started to read this near-term extinction narrative that, that you saw an alternative reading of the data um, and so for, for a couple of years I sort of fell into that space and then I started to be more critical of the underlying science and actually more circumspect about the, um, you know, the philosophy of we're all doomed, there's nothing we can do about it, doesn't, it's not really helpful for anybody. Um, and, but, there, but there's still even, there still really is sort of a couple of camps, one of which says the climate change is manageable and the other that says it's actually a planetary emergency. So the question is where do, where do you sit on that spectrum? And, um, and how do you see that spectrum being portrayed? Is there, do certain media outlets sort of fall on one side or the other? That's kind of, so I think at the extremes, it gets easier to answer that. And so I think, I, I think it, it, it might be a little oversimplifying to have, um, to call it an emergency as an end point of the spectrum, because I think that actually encompasses sort of an upper portion of the spectrum, because I would say that that's true. I think that every climate scientist would say that that's true. Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm signing on to uh, the claims that humanity is going to be extinct in 20 years. I think that that means something different. I think it's a fair way to describe it, but I, I just wouldn't want to be included with that kind of view. So, but if you look at the, the kind of spread in the media, uh, you can find the outlets that are very dismissive of climate change at all, in general. Um, the, uh, well, I'm trying to think now. <laughs> The Australian is the Murdoch paper, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. So you know, you find examples there, or um, uh, Fox News and other related things like that. Mm. So those kind of very squarely sit over on the far side. And so maybe more interesting is how would you characterize the kind of nuanced position of more reasonable outlets? I think that mm. that probably varies from story to story. I don't really get the feeling that there are there are a lot of stories out there that are that are saying. Uh, climate change is a thing, but not a very bad thing. It seems like the coverage is generally on sort of on message, you could say, with it being sort of 
extremely top of the list pressing concern that we haven't done anything about still. Mm. Uh, now, again, that doesn't go to onto the we're going to be extinct in 10 years mm. side of it, but I, I think it, it stays towards that end at least. And so hypothetically, I mean, that, and that's a really good point you made is that um, in all of my reading about climate change, uh, you know, next year, like hypothetically a year from today, um, we're going to have an extra 38 billion tonnes of CO2 in the atmosphere. I mean, it's almost guaranteed, if not, if not more. Mm -hmm. And so, because, um, I mean, even after 2015 and the Paris Agreement being signed, which is about reducing carbon, we've had more carbon go into the atmosphere every year since Paris. And so, and so one of the phenomena that we're actually looking at is the possibility that nothing actually changes, is that the power structures on the planet are so fixed that that no doesn't matter what the science is or how many children take the day off school that nothing's actually going to change so um do you see that happening okay and secondly what what do you see happening to this planet if we continue that business as usual which is effectively 38 gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere every year going on so i think that i see uh, I don't see a world where we don't do anything. I don't think that that's really in the cards anymore. And the, the sort of, um, well, what was called business as usual was to continue the trajectory of increasing every year and not even, not even stabilizing your emissions level, much less the amount in the atmosphere. But um, the, I was gonna say, that what, what I, I don't see that kind of happening. And I think, so that's sort of what's in, in climate science is often the scenario is labeled RCP 8.5, if you've yeah. been reading things uh, for those out there. And there's been sort of a lot of interesting criticism uh, um, in the scientific community about, is that a good scenario to use for the top end? Is that plausible? Uh, is that the best representative of kind of what is the really the worst case, which is, it's interesting in either direction, but I think it requires sort of a commitment to continuing that way of growth. And I, I think we're seeing already that we're, we're dropping off of that kind of commitment where we have to end up uh, cutting emissions to some level. And so the question is to what level, you know, because the, the Paris agreement pledges, if they are met, then we're at something like 3.3 C warming or so instead of four, four and a half, uh, but we would like to be at two, at less than two. And so do we, do we meet those commitments and get to three and a half to, to three, somewhere in that range? Um, that's a fair question. And I think that there are plenty of signs that those things are happening such that I don't view that as requiring a, a sort of an excessive amount of optimism at this point, that I can see that happening. And so do, can I see more happening? Can I see us dropping below 3C and getting to 2? That's where I get increasingly skeptical. Right. And so, and so two, 2 degrees um, as, the, uh, as the target, the way I sort of, <laughs> the way I read 2 degrees is to, is to describe a family going down to the, to the seaside next to the cliffs and they've got the toddler, you know, and, and, the, and the father says, to, or the mother says to the child, don't go too close to the edge of the cliff, right? And so two degrees is actually the edge of the cliff, in my understanding. <laughs> and, so, and so if you had a child next to, on, the, on the grass next to the cliffs, you don't actually set the threshold at the edge of the cliff. You set it some hundred meters back or, you know, somewhere. And so, do, I mean, do you see the two degrees mark? I mean, my understanding of two degrees is that if we get to two degrees, then all hell uh, is let loose, including runaway feedback effects, which I think we're already seeing. Um, how do you read two degrees? Is, is two degrees really bad news as far as in your view? It's, it's certainly bad news. I don't, I don't think I see it as a, a sort of a bright line dropping off point where we, I, I think that it's, I mean, the fact that it's a round number sort of shows us that it was fairly arbitrarily selected, you know, and, yeah. and so, you know, do, do we, do, what happens at 1.9 versus 2.1? I don't, I, I don't see that being a, a particularly large thing. I think that uh, 2C in general is a bad idea, and it always was a bad idea. And it would have been nice if back in the early 90s we had actually done what it would have taken to make getting below 2C possible. Mm. But, we didn't. Uh, but I, I don't really see 
bright lines at any point where there are threshold effects that we know about, where we can be sort of um, extremely worried about this certain boundary or another boundary. And so I always see it as there's basically an infinite range of futures here. And every, every step up you go, it gets worse. And every step down you go, it gets better. And so you can always, every day, you now have the opportunity. Do you take the steps to make it a little better or the steps to make it a little worse? And I think yeah. that that generally continues to be the case for a fairly long time. Right. Okay. And, um, but what, what is clear though, is that there are these, um, you know, at the moment there's a sense that climate change is in the hands of the humans in as much as we're dumping so much carbon in the atmosphere. Um, but if you then start to factor in the positive feedback effects, um, which is starting to become evident, I mean, um, just talking like, for example, in Australia, we've got wildfire, uh, well, wildfire. <laughs> in fact, I was just reading the other day was that they've got wildfires in the UK right now in the middle of winter. If I'm correct. And so if you add wildfire and you add the methane and you add, um, so that's like positive feedbacks, but also if you add in the failing of the carbon sinks, um, at some point, you know, it's possible that the humans won't be the main drivers of climate change anymore. The planet will be uh, um, doing its work. How do you see climate positive feedbacks? And also, do you see um, negative feedback mechanisms? And, and how does that balance sort of match out? Yeah. So there, there certainly are negative feedbacks in the, in the climate system. Uh, there are, and it depends on sort of how close you look as to whether you're going to find them or how many there are, or how big they are. Uh, but you could, I mean, the, the simplest, because I've been teaching climate change this semester and we've been sort of progressing through just this week, we were sort of looking through all the feedbacks and we've been coming from this sort of very simple uh, mathematical model of the energy coming in to the earth and the energy leaving at different wavelengths and noticing that the amount of energy the earth emits increases very sharply as its temperature rises, which is a negative feedback. So it's, right. it's the amount of energy emitted is, is actually temperature to the fourth power. Uh, right. And so this is a key, you know, negative feedback in it. But there, so the thing is, I think that if we didn't have any information about past climates, I would be much more um, concerned and feeling like I'm groping around in the dark and waiting to land on the spikes uh, as we kind of go forward a little bit. But because we do have these records of past climate changes that can help support our understanding of climate sensitivity, of how much warming we should get out of our emissions, it, it helps us feel a little more confident that we have an idea about that number. And it's not that just that we're, we're waiting to see if suddenly it jumps from, you know, 3C to 7C or something like that. Um, we, there's a, there are limits on what you can expect based on what we've seen in the past. And so I think it's fair to sort of expect the, the, the range of climate sensitivity that studies have been turning up for years now, you know, roughly three degrees C for a doubling of CO2. Um, I feel pretty good about that being true. Now in the, what becomes much more interesting to us is, you know, we're interested in what happens in the next few decades. And so the question is, as you kind of approach that long-term uh, sensitivity number, the, what the eventual warming would be, where are the bumps and the valleys in that? Do you trigger, you know, more, carbon release from permafrost and stuff like that soon than you thought you would. And so the warming, it goes a little faster. Like those are certainly fair things to think about, but I, I think that the context of past climate change is very helpful in that, in that regard, sort of adding up all the positive and negative feedbacks. Right. Okay. And so that, um, that, that one, the feedback you mentioned that as the planet gets hotter, the rate of energy loss de uh, increases. Yeah. I've got that right. So what are the other major, uh, negative feedback mechanisms that are playing out now. One, uh, one I'll actually point out that I, I noticed was I was in the UK in 2017 when Hurricane Maria came through the Caribbean and oh, yeah. Puerto Rico, and there was a <laughs> there was some satellite photographs of uh, Puerto Rico at night before and after, and at and at night before it was all lit up with you know diesel uh, oil powered street lamps, um, <laughs> and afterwards it was dark 
and I went and did some sums, and I think that was about seven megatons a year of carbon that weren't wasn't being released into the atmosphere because the lights went off and the power went down. But one of the other major, um, apart from disaster, what are the other major negative feedback mechanisms playing out? So that's actually, it's a very fair point. There was a, a study, I want to say in the last year, maybe six months ago or so, uh, where the, the economists were looking at kind of the economic models for the, the impacts of climate change on economic growth, which is this thing that everyone debates, right? And they were pointing out that this should be connected to our scenarios for future emissions when we're calculating that. Those things need to go back and forth because they worked out, and I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but they worked out there was a, a not trivial decrease in the potential for economic growth because of a warming planet. And that, that is in itself a negative feedback. It limits how much you can emit. Uh, but you can look at, in the, so in, in the current sort of short term, the fact that the oceans absorb some of the CO2 that we emit, which causes its own issues and separately from climate change, obviously ocean acidification is just as bad in many ways, but it, between the, the ocean and the land ecosystems, taking half, more than half of the carbon that we've put into the atmosphere is not in the atmosphere. It's in those places instead. And so without those negative feedbacks, we would already be experiencing more warming. And so that's an example. Uh, you could look at the behavior of certain types of clouds. And overall, we think that clouds are a positive feedback, but it's, com it's composed of different behaviors of different types of clouds. And some of them are negative and some of them are positive. Uh, the, the related to the way that the planet sheds heat, the uh, temperature profile of the troposphere, the way that the air cools as you get higher up, uh, that the way that changes also helps shed heat as you warm. And so that's another negative feedback called the lapse rate feedback. So they're in there. Mm. Uh, we don't talk about them as much, I think, and some of them are wonkier, but these things, they all get added up, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And so would you say that, and is it, is it true to say that if you could uh, measure, if you like, the negative feedbacks and measure the positive feedbacks, that it's a simple sum and that, if, you, if one is bigger than the other, then it tends towards uh, increased heating or, or decreased heating. Is it, is, it, can you, is it as simple as that? There can, I mean, there can be interactions between them where if you, if you tried to estimate them on their own and add them, it might not be the same as letting them affect each other right. as they right. put it out. Yeah, but complex and dynamic. But if, there, if there were no positive or negative feedbacks, Mm. Doubling CO2 would warm the planet by about 1.2 degrees C. Just, and I guess, well, that's not no negative or positive feedbacks, is it? That's just the, the radiative yeah. sort of energy in and energy out. So it would include a couple of these things. But going from 1.2 to our best guess being around three means that the, if you add up all the positive and negative feedbacks, the positives win because we're getting yeah. more than 1.2, not less. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that's that's how much more. Yeah. Okay. And and there's um, this conversation about um, this this idea of hypothetically, if we were, to, and this when I talk to people about climate change for the first time, and I give them like you know Guy Lane's climate change one hundred and one, the real kicker comes in, which is where the jaw drops, which is when I when I talk about um, um, aerosol masking effect and also uh, the lag. And so the idea is hypothetically, you know, if you talk about climate change in a very simplistic way, you can say, well, if we just stop burning the fossil fuels, then, you know, eventually things will get better. But we've got this thing called the lag, right? So, and I'm still actually struggling to get my head around the science of the lag, so maybe you can help me with this. But the idea being that if we were to stop burning fossil fuels today, hypothetically across the planet, apart from the fact that releasing all of that sulfates and other material into the atmosphere has a cooling effect, which is the global dimming or the aerosol masking effect, which means if you stop burning the fossil fuels, you get an immediate warming in some places, um, which I think is sufficiently large enough to actually have a global influence. But you've also got this thing called the lag, which says that the, the heating of the planet is actually delayed by some decades, years or decades, after the emission of the CO2. So if you actually stop burning fossil fuels, leaving aside the, the dimming effect, um, it's still gonna get hotter for some time. Can you explain that? Yeah, so 
um, I guess the best way to, so one thing that is helpful to get straight here is that you have to know what scenario you want to envision before you can kind of do the math. And this is where I see sort of different sources kind of saying different things and people get confused. The two kind of scenarios you have to think about are, are we making the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere constant? Mm -hmm. So are we somehow dialing down emissions just enough to, you know, near, very near zero, but still positive, such that we maintain 405 parts per million or what yeah. it is, or whatever. Because that's a common thing that's done in a climate model in these, in these studies and these simulations uh, to find out what's going to happen in, one, in, in a scenario is to just to hold the CO2 constant and let everything else change. And that can give you one answer. But if your question is, if we turn off all CO2 emissions tomorrow and now what happens, uh, it's not, it's the, the concentration doesn't stay constant. It starts to slowly drop off. And that changes your numbers. Mm. So mm -hmm. the, the lag in general primarily has to do with the oceans taking up heat. Yeah. Because the oceans are, have a, just a tremendous amount of heat capacity. And so there's partly the effect of the, the surface waters need to take in the heat and change in temperature, which happens fairly gradually. And at the same time, the oceans are circulating and bringing up cold water that hasn't seen this heat yet. And so if you, if you, for example, if you hold the concentration of CO2 constant for 2000 years simulated in your model, mm -hmm. there's sort of the, the overturning of the ocean takes so long that it's a very long time before you stop bringing up cold water that can now warm and sort of increase the total amount in the ocean. And you get this very gradual but very long continued uh, warming effect. But if we are talking about a scenario where we stop emitting and you let the carbon cycle start to take out some of that CO2, uh, it, it drops a fair amount of it in the near decades. And then the last bit of it takes thousands of years. <laughs> uh, and so it's this, there is a drop and then a very long tail to it. And so it, but in that scenario, you can get different amounts of, as the CO2 is dropping and as that lag effect is still warming the oceans, sort of balancing all these things together, what does the temperature do in a, in a scenario like that? Which is, is, it's fairly interesting. And there've been a few studies trying to do this with long-term simulations, which requires a slightly simplified model. And I can't recall the numbers off the top of my head, but it's a little bit surprising when you look at it and you, and you think about <clears throat> what do I expect to happen? Uh, oh, would temperature really like maybe stabilize in this situation because the CO2 is dropping and so you're slowly losing that greenhouse effect that would have continued your warming. Instead, you're just gonna stay steady. It gets really complicated really quickly. Um, now there was one, the aerosol effect, for example, and because this is a good way to kind of illustrate this. In, I believe the last U.S. National Climate Assessment report, which um, I can't remember if it was last year's or the one from the year before. I think it was last year's. They, no, no, I'm sorry. It's from the IPCC 1.5 report they did this. They calculated if we stop emitting CO2 today, how much warming is still destined to happen? Because the yeah. first question they had to ask was, is it even possible to stop yeah. at 1.5 C, even if we stop emitting everything today. And so their conclusion was that the amount of warming that comes from losing aerosols and the sort of what's in the, in the pipeline, as it's described, from the lag effect, if you actually drop your emissions to zero, is, is less than half a degree C at this point. That's their best estimate. Which kind of gives you an answer to that question. Yeah, in, in so, way, so I thought. Say that again. So if, if we stopped, what's, what's, so this is what they call baked in or in the pipeline, right? Yeah. So right. If, you, if we stopped all emissions yeah. today, yeah. Uh, what is destined to happen anyway? And yeah. their, their conclusion was it is, it is likely less than half a degree C. Right. Okay. It, additional? Additional. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Which will, which will bring us up. So what, where are we now? Around 1.2? Is that right? I, th I think 1.1 1. 1 is probably... Okay, so if we stopped, so if we stopped producing carbon emissions overnight, 
then we're going to go to 1.6, right? So we're going to, so we've, we've broken less than, yeah, it was less than 0.5. Um, okay. I mean, right. they didn't put an exact number on it, but they said probably less than 0.5 because their conclusion was basically that it, it should still technically be possible to yeah. with immediate action. Yeah. And yeah. up at 1.5. Yeah. And how, <laughs> how, how are we looking with that immediate action? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, the, the Australian um, uh, writer, I'm just trying to think of his name. Um, uh, he, he said, I'll come, come up with his name in a minute, but he, I was watching a, a video with him recently, an interview, and he said, if you think it's unreasonable uh, to believe that there will be major widespread and effective action on climate change, which, which I mean, itself is just a terrifying concept in a way because it means that somehow we've got to get the most powerful people and institutions on the planet to stop doing the thing that makes them powerful, um, to stop to make them powerful. I mean, that, that itself, I mean, for me, climate change is always, well, for a long time since I've been thinking about this, climate change is not really an issue of science or technology or economics. It's really just about power. It's about who, who makes the decisions on the planet. Um, and so what, we, what have we got to give away to have the most powerful people and institutions on the planet stop doing the thing that makes them powerful? That's a question. And so what, um, uh, this is Paul Gilding, that's the name I was looking for, um, the author of uh, the, the, the Great Disruption or Climate Disruption. Um, he was saying, if you think it's unreasonable to believe that the, the world will actually take meaningful action on climate change, he says, it's even more unreasonable to believe that governments won't act when the shit starts hitting the fan. And so, and so his sort of model is that we're going into this period of great turmoil, the great, the, the great disruption, he calls it. Um, but from that will come this awakening, um, which will then effectively create this new order of power and energy, power as in political power, but also in how we generate our energy. Um, so, so what do you see coming down the pipeline in terms of like collapse um, and, um, and, and where do you see the biggest evidence of uh, this shift actually already happening? So I think what I would say to that is that I see sort of the, the economics and the public sentiment yeah. reaching a point where it, it becomes more powerful than some of those things, uh, which is been sort of it has been surprising and, and an encouraging thing at a much needed time. Both of our countries have been through this. Uh, make your pledges, start moving in the right direction. Someone takes power, throws it all in the garbage. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's like the the one sort of and the great example here in the U.S. now is Donald Trump. And when Trump came into office, he was going to restore coal to its 18th century glory. You know, and and he and the. The good thing is that he can't, he hasn't been able to, mm. and it doesn't work. It can't do it. It's dead. It's gone. No one wants it. Mm. And so no matter what, how many regulations he repeals and how many speeches he gives, coal still costs more to generate electricity in many places than at least natural gas, if not uh, solar and wind now. And so mm. no one cares. Mm. And that has been in a sort of, such a such an encouraging thing to me that that even with this sort of you could think we had policies in place we're starting to push in the right direction we needed to ratchet them up to meet our goals and instead someone comes in and tears them all down and you think that's it your progress is gone how do you start over and the good thing has been that there has still been progress over the, this period of time because the president of the united states doesn't control everything mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the the technologies are doing what the technologies are doing. The prices are coming down and people want those things. Mm. And so the electric utilities feel pressure. They want to provide more solar and wind power because all their customers are asking for it. Mm. And they're saying, we'll pay more with, you know, give us the surcharge. I want that one. I don't want the other one. Mm. And so those things I see as really encouraging. Now I think those that doesn't matter unless countries like China and India can turn in a different way because maybe in countries like the United States and Australia and European nations, that sort of economic drive can have a, can make a big difference. Mm. But in China, something else is going on and something mm. else has to happen. And that's a place where maybe 
even if you would say the, the climate shit really hasn't hit the fan in China, uh, the pollution certainly has, and they've taken the, the projection seriously enough to be very worried about their water supply in the, in the Himalayas and things like that. And so you've seen the actions they've taken in the last few years, where from 2000 to 2011 or whatever it was, China was growing at just preposterous uh, levels and burning more coal than you could believe every year. And in the last few years, they've put in a new plan, made new rules, and they're, they're changing so sharply and so quickly. And that's what has to happen in China and in order for any of this to matter. And if, but if it does, it's a huge deal for, for the planet. You could talk about, you know, if the oil companies in sort of the Western hemisphere want to uh, scratch and claw at their last remaining profits, maybe they can't sink the boat if China is pushing right. us in a better direction, you know? Yeah, and that's, that's a, another good point as well, is because, you know, getting, getting rid of coal is obviously, I mean, from, a, from an energy to carbon perspective, coal is worse than oil and oil is worse than gas. Mm -hmm. um, but but I, my understanding, if my, if my numbers are correct, I think uh, if you actually, I think gas has still got about half of the carbon emissions per unit of energy yeah. So gas isn't like clean compared to coal. It's just right. half mm. as dirty. Um, so getting rid of coal is obviously the first one because of, of that reason, but also because it produces so much, because there's so much crap in coal that comes out of the smokestack, uh, air pollutants, uh, as you mentioned, but also, uh, well, you know, air pollutants, not only visually, but, you know, health wise. Mm. Um, so getting rid of, and also coal is stationary and stationary is easy to replicate with renewables because you just put solar and wind and, whatever but getting rid of um oil that's the problem so oil is still a significant proportion of the carbon emissions in the atmosphere around about 30 percent i think globally um i've got an associate in uh, brisbane who uh, works with um, algae biofuels who's got a mm. model um that suggests that algae biofuels could be are very very close to being um at the point at which they could easily replace fossil uh, fossil oil um, cost competitively it's not far away now um, but what I've noticed as well in my 16 years of, of watching this subject I'd always thought for a long time that as soon as renewables became cheaper than fossil fuels that the shift would happen almost overnight but I'd never actually figured the uh, extent of the political conniving to prop mm. up uh, the industries and particularly in Australia with our liberal federal government who, who pretty much look like an extension of the fossil fuel industry. I mean, they just, I mean, it's so clever the way that they just bold facedly, you know, promote, you know, and th this country would have, this country would be well underway to carbon neutrality had it not been for the political interference. And so this comes back to power. And so for so long as the fossil fuel industry controls the power, um, they control the politics and even though renewables is cheaper in Australia than most of the other energy sources, we're still stuck with it. So, and this is sort of part of this, um, uh, the, the inertia or the, you know, the, 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 the inability to change, um, that I, I see is problematical. I was reading the other day, um, uh, a, uh, I think it was on carbon brief and it had a country summary and I was reading about Japan and its cl uh, climate uh, targets under Paris. And what they were saying is, if I remember the numbers correctly, they're going to reduce 26% by 2030. And that was 26% of 2005 emissions. And if you actually did the sums by 2030, they were still going to be producing a gigaton of carbon. And so, I mean, part of this is that even the most um, advanced um, uh, reduction efforts that are planned or discussed are still a very, very long way away from actually getting to where we need to be. And this seems to be part of the problem is that, uh, it, is that it always comes down to this theoretically, if we do this, we should be okay. But practically and in reality, we just don't. And, you know, you mentioned the RCP 8.5. And if you look at all of the previous um, uh, uh, trajectories of potential carbon emissions, going back all of, all of, in all of the IPCC reports, Every time that actually reviewed what happened the year before, it was always worse than the worst case scenario. You know, so can you can you comment on that? Because there's this, um, it, because it comes down again down to politics and power. Uh, 
and who's making the decisions? How do we get through that? I mean, you mentioned um, public support and the economics, but is that enough? Is there enough of that to actually see a transformation? Because we need a transformation, right? We can't have this slow, gradual, slowly getting better because the carbon keeps going up. Right, and so it's sort of, the slow processes can only bring you down so far. And so if you want a better future than that, then yeah, you need accelerators that do yeah. those things. And I think you need, you can't be trying to overcome leadership in these leading nations who are pushing in the opposite direction. That's too much drag on the system to get to where you want to be. So I think that's fair to say that the, the sort of the amount you can get to without that, really having that leadership in charge pushing is not going to make you happy. It's not going to make anybody happy. Yeah. And you need a lot more than that. But sort of what you were saying about the, you know, the trajectories, pledges and things like that, it's kind of what, you know, what you're saying about picturing rapid changes in the energy system and things like that. It's kind of on a building momentum kind of model where if you can bend the curve down, you assume that you've kind of done the hardest thing and that the next, the next period of time, you're able to bend it more sharply than you were before. Yeah, yeah. Which is a little bit of putting it off into the future, right? It's kind of procrastinating to yeah. bank on that being possible, but it's also kind of the way people see most of these energy system transformations and things like that, where solar hits a tipping point. You know, solar becomes so cheap, storage comes online and it's cheap enough that every coal plant that is getting a little old and a little long in the tooth, they shut it down and they don't replace it with fossil fuel because why would they? They put up solar panels instead. And then once you get into that kind of cascading phase that you make more progress than maybe you were initially seeing down the road, you know? Yeah, I hear, I hear you saying. So, so instead of thinking of, so, I mean, in a way, the progress to date has actually been negative in the past. Whilst we have actually, you know, had some efforts at reducing, you know, carbon emissions and transformation to renewables, the carbon budget of the planet or the carbon emissions of the planet continues to go up pretty much in every country. So, so just doing the little things is actually taking us in the wrong direction. But what you're saying is that if you can have, if you can have those little wins, for example, in Australia, you know, it's cheaper to produce energy with solar, wind and batteries than it is in any other form. And that's new stuff then that builds on itself. And so rather than thinking of it as a, as basically a straight line and we're not getting anywhere or thinking of it as a sharp cliff where all of a sudden there's like a revolution in power and all of the, mm -hmm. um, you know, all of the fossil fuel barons are put under house arrest and then marked up to a, to a cliff somewhere, um, <laughs> which is one option. Um, but what you're saying is that you get, you get these little wins and then the little wins build on themselves and you end up with this sort of exponential curve of little wins which if you were to then model that, you could actually then effectively see a very sharp drop off, albeit not overnight, but sort of extended over a number of decades. I mean, my reading on this in another way is that, and that's actually, that's a really interesting comment and that's, and that's shifted my thinking a little bit because one of the, um, the ways that I'd sort of seen this was, was that we don't have at the moment the institutions that we need to actually transform the planet. So if you, you know, um, I'm a fiction writer and one of my fiction novels is called Intervene and, and in the story Intervene there's a scientist who's on the TV interview and he says that there is no institutions on the planet which are capable of overseeing the transition that we need, the ecological transition and nor, nor are there any group of institutions. I mean if you look at for example the United Nations I mean huge bureaucracy which doesn't really actually kind of do much you know I mean you know I mean they haven't fixed climate change for example and there's no institutions that can do it. Um, um, but, but, but what you're saying is that there is the potential for this exponential increase in pace once things actually start heading in the right direction, particularly with technology and energy transformation and costs. Um, and in an almost bottom-up way rather than a top-down way, yeah. to, some, to some respects at least. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Well, that's, um, that's an I think a good example of that is, is the sort of the grid of the energy system. Uh, as we start to incorporate more renewable energies, we start having to deal with 
the way that renewable energy works. And it's, you know, many of them are more intermittent. And so we're starting to put the systems into place so that the grid can handle intermittent systems. Yeah. And once you've done that, then you can add more renewable and then the grid sort of catches up to do it. And now your options open up even more. So whereas when you started, 40% renewable might've been impossible given the, the infrastructure. Mm. By the time you've gotten your kind of mm. made headway on that, you open up those possibilities that weren't there before. Yeah, now that's, that, that's a very good point as well. So in my, uh, my consulting work back in North Queensland, um, I did a lot of work with the council who are doing a lot of work with the energy utility. And one of the big issues there was uh, everyone wanted to go solar, but the, the grid couldn't handle it. There was pieces of infrastructure which simply didn't allow energy to flow back um, but by the time you actually go through and fix that, then all of a sudden the possibility of the whole thing becoming solar actually pretty much happens largely overnight. Yeah. So, you, and, and, and in the past in looking at the um, energy transformations going from um, uh, water wheels to coal and from coal to oil and um, when it gets going, it gets going at quite a clip and, and energy transformations are also associated with great um, surges in wealth and job creation um, and, 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 and particularly in, in looking in America, I mean, I, <laughs> I, had, I was in America when I was about seven years old for a couple of days, but I've never <laughs> been back and looking at America, I'm like, wow, that's a big, you don't want America to go belly up. That's a big, <laughs> with a lot of guns, but, um, but it seems like something like the green new deal. Um, I don't know the detail of it or how well thought through it is technically, but the idea of unleashing the power of market forces um, to, to basically transform the, the nation's energy supply seems like a really, really something that America is really, uh, could really benefit from right now. I mean, the, the, the employment that it will create and also if it can be put in with some sort of mechanism to um, allow wealth to be more evenly distributed could bring America back to a halcyon days almost. Yeah, and I think it's that sort of message that it's a very nebulous concept what the Green New Deal would be, but uh, it's it's proving very popular. People like the sound of it at least, and I think it's sort of one of these first steps to do something that makes a lot of sense, which is to describe the better future you want to make instead of telling people you have to eat your vegetables or you'll die because we've been saying we have to stop using this and stop using that, and stop using that. And no one knows what that looks like. They just think it means less and worse and I'm poorer and there's no concept of it. And so if you're talking about let's do these things, let's have a cleaner environment. Let's have, you know, let's live longer because we're not breathing in coal soot and stuff. And you can have jobs doing these things. And people can see that that's a place they might want to go and a thing they might want to build. It's just a more positive message. Yeah, 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 yeah. In Australia, we've got this, um, uh, well, one thing that's become apparent in Australia is this concept of um, uh, the possibility of pumped hydro. So this mm. is where you have a dam at elevation and a dam lower down, and you have a, gener a, a turbine that moves water up to, to using either off-peak power or, um, or, you know, renewables, and then when the water falls down, you can generate it. So basically creating these huge, batteries and I understand that pumped hydro or pumped hydro storage is some of the cheapest energy storage on the planet and there's a conversation at the moment of this uh, I think the government the federal government has just put allocated another 1.4 billion dollars towards a thing called snowy snowy hydro 2 which is basically up, upgrading this existing hydro power station with pump storage but uh, I was talking to somebody about this the other day and apparently there are thousands of opportunities for pump storage around Australia. The geography of the country in relation to its energy network means that mm. there is massive opportunities. And so if you put in this, this, this beginning of this curve, as you described it, which then becomes exponential and then you build in the infrastructure, which enables it, you know, conceivably a nation like Australia could pretty much dump um, at least its mains electricity uh, can, can go carbon neutral probably within the space of a decade and do that in a manner which is actually positive for the uh, economy because of the massive amounts of jobs that it will create and all of the spin-off effects that comes from that. Um, and then of course, you've got your, your fuels, um, which then potentially comes from your algae biofuels. Uh, the big one, the difficult one though, seems to be aviation um, mm -hmm. 
fuel because of, it's so high, highly refined. Um, but again, from what I've been discussing with my associate who's into the algae biofuels, you can grow that stuff with algae. And one of the, one of the really interesting observations as well is in my, in my time advising people on carbon is that the rate at which you can decarbonize the economy is actually related to the technology. And so in a way, it was always bad advice to say to people that if you want to um, go carbon neutral, if you want to protect the planet, just, use, just make the best rational decisions economically um, because the best rational decisions economically were only marginally better than bad. Yeah. But now we're actually in a situation where, where, that, where that's shifted and the only thing that's really holding back this massive transformation is the politics. And you're saying that um, uh, there's a good chance that that's going to give way as well. So you're, you're rather, um, I wouldn't say, uh, I mean, let me just ask you this, just as we wrap up, because we've had time now, but, um, you know, in, on the spectrum of optimism versus pessimism, which is rather crude sort of spectrum, how do you sort of see yourself with respect to um, climate change and what's coming down the pipeline? Because we've already, we've already done a lot of damage to the planet and it's going to take a while for us. So at some point, you know, hypothetically, the planet will start to get better. Um, where, how, how far out do you see that is? And what, what do you think is going to happen on this planet before, before we get to that point? Yeah. And I'm glad you asked that because I wanted to try to sneak in. I, I don't want to sound like the most optimistic person you've ever met because I'm not. I think that when I see small incremental improvements, I maybe get a little more optimistic about them than would you would at face value because I think of this kind of momentum building sort of thing that what that could open up. But I think of uh, climate change is already a very significant hazard and a very significant, you know, a weight weighing down our quality of life and the survival of us and everything else on this planet. And so I, I don't, I do not want to pretend that I'm at the optimistic end of that scale, uh, but I'm certainly not at the pessimistic scale. I'm, and I'm sort of maybe leaning a little bit optimistic <laughs> of neutral. Uh, I don't, I don't think I'm, I would eat all the hats in the world if we stop at 2C. There's just no way it happens. Um, I'm hopeful and I think I can, my gut is that we stop before 3C. That's kind of what I see being a reasonable, plausible reading of the future to me, which means uh, that a lot of things that are already bad get significantly worse and yeah. a lot of people suffer because of it. And you know, climate change isn't the only thing that causes suffering around the world, but it certainly exacerbates a lot of it and, and it's the kind of threat multiplier effect of those things. And so it's ugly. And I don't, I don't want to paint the way I view the future as anything but ugly. It's yeah. just that there are uglier futures too. And yeah. I'm hopeful that we'll avoid those. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We couldn't, couldn't end this with a, with a fear <laughs> without a little bit of, Bloom thrown in there. Um, one of the uh, one of my expressions that I've been throwing around a little bit recently, I, I haven't come to the end of it. Is um, you know, there's no good news in climate change except that it's not as bad as it could be. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey Scott, it's uh, it's been really yeah, uh, it's really great to have a chat with you. Extremely uh, cogent and um, clear-eyed and and very easy to. Um, siphon information out of so i'll be coming back to you again for for more of this if that's okay with you um so uh, in the meantime thanks very much for uh, your time and uh hope to talk to you soon great thanks i enjoyed the conversation it was good okay great